Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's middle game video, I'm going to talk about the power of the bishop pair. Uh, we are going to look at uh, three very interesting games uh, at the end of the video, just to give you an example of what a bishop pair could do. Could do. And for an introduction, I'm going to talk about some basics of having the bishop pair and uh, fighting against the bishop pair. Now, in the first example which I've set up, which is not from a real game, this is just uh, a random position I've set up on the board to show you the difference uh, between the bishop pair and the other combinations of minor pieces, you can see that uh, the bishop pair is extremely powerful and that it's able to control uh, too many key squares on the board for uh, the opposing sides to fight. And very often the bishop pair will be as strong as a pair of rooks. Uh, if you imagine having uh, two rooks on, let's say, h2 and h3, they would be controlling these two files and they would be putting pressure along both color complexes because they are rooks. Now, when you have one bishop, it's fairly uh, simple to, to have it dampened because your opponent can put all of their pieces and all of their pawns on the opposing color complex and then your, beca your bishop becomes obsolete. Now, in this position, let's say uh, black had a couple of pawns. If you only had the light squared bishop, everything black would have to do is put them, let's say, on the dark squares and then your bishop would have no target. Uh, on the other hand, when you have two bishops, then there is no way for your opponent to hide. And as I said, often uh, the pair of bishops will serve as a pair of rooks, which is extremely powerful. Now, in chess uh, uh, piece evaluation, uh, the bishop is, is worth the same as a knight. There have been some arguments that the bishop should be uh, worth 0.3 more. So if a knight is worth 3, a bishop should be worth 3.3. And when you have a pair of bishops, then it definitely is uh, the case and the bishops do become more powerful. Now, of course, it will all depend on the pawn structure. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in several other videos, but just for, for a brief, brief intro here. Uh, the bishops love open positions. That's clear from uh, what they are able to do. Uh, if you put a lot of pawns on the board, then these two bishops will have far less scope. On the other hand, knights love closed positions. So the more pawns there, there are on the board, the, closed, the more closed the position is, uh, the bishops are going to be worse. So if you have the bishop pair, your goal is, as we are going to see in the first game example, Tiviakov Kasparov, uh, your goal is to open up the position and give your uh, bishops as much scope as possible. In the, in the second position I've set up, this is also a random position, uh, you can see that the position is open. Uh, the, an open position is one where there are no pawns on the E and, and the D file, which makes the, the center unblocked and open. Uh, the bishops are definitely much better than the knight. If you just see how many squares the bishops are controlling and how many roles they are fulfilling, I'm not sure that there is anybody who would rather have black's position here. The engines actually give this as more than plus one, even though the material is equal. And the main reason for that is that white's bishops are able to both defend and attack at the same time, uh, whereas black's knights are not even able to enter the game. You can see that the bishops are restricting too many key squares for the, knight to, for the knights to enter the game, and it's very hard for black to do anything. Um, black would, for example, go here, but then after the bishop moves, it will become extremely hard to move any farther. So the bishop pair is extremely good at uh, restraining the other minor pieces, even rooks. And... Uh, the key thing to remember here, if you have the bishop pair, you want an open position. If you put pawns um, on, let's say, c6, uh, d5, e4, uh, and f6, then, then both of these bishops would be uh, far less useful, and the knights would actually be better. The knights will love positions which are closed, and the, and the bishops will love open positions. Uh, in the next example, uh, this is from a, from a real game, this is the Berlin defense endgame, you can see an example in which uh, Black uh, gives up his castling rights and accepts a slightly worse pawn structure with his pawns doubled on the c-file in order to get the bishop pair. And uh, 
This, of course, was popularized by Vladimir Kramnik, the Berlin defense, the Berlin defense endgame. I'm not going to go too much into that. But one of the key aspects of the opening is that Black gets the bishop pair. And that's one of the main reasons that Black accepts having his, his king unable to castle on d8 and having doubled pawns. Whereas White has already castled and has a perfect pawn structure apart from the overextended d5 pawn. So we can see uh, examples of openings in which one side will... Uh, accept several weaknesses just to get the bishop pair. And now, the situation that you have on the board is that you have the f8 bishop and the c8 bishop fighting against the c1 bishop and the b1 knight. And it's fairly obvious uh, which uh, combination of minor pieces is better, especially since the position is semi-open and there are no pawn pawns on the d-file, and it's unlikely that the position is going to be blocked. Uh, had uh, white an option to block down the position, then the Berlin defense wouldn't be as popular. So the bishop pair is a very powerful weapon. And uh, just to, sh to show you one, one more example, uh, this is uh, uh, the wrong uh, colored square bishop. Uh, and this is a very important endgame you need to know. And I wanted to use this example just to emphasize the power of the two bishops. This is a very well-known endgame in which white is a bishop and the pawn down uh, and the pawn up, but he is unable to win. There's a very simple reason for that. Uh, if you try advancing your pawn, uh, the the black king can't be forced from the dark square on h8, and your bishop is actually obsolete and it's doing nothing. This is either stal stalemate or a repetition. Now, if you add five more light squared bishops on the board, you can put them here, 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 sorry, here, here, and here, you still can't win. You can have 20 light squared bishops, you can't win. If you add a dark squared bishop on the board, you can even, even remove the pawn, and you have a mating net around Black's king. So the two bishops are important because they complement each other. Very often one bishop is going to be weak because it's not going to have any targets. Two bishops always have targets. Okay, now let's go on to the games. Uh, the first game example I wanted to show you is the game Tiviak of Kasparov. Uh, this came from a Sicilian defense. Uh, in which uh, Gary Kasparov played the early f4, uh, the Grand Prix attack. Uh, and uh, in this position, Gary has the bishop pair. Uh, that's obvious. He has two wonderful bishops on two wonderful squares. His last move was f5. Why f5? You might see me slightly, you might, it might seem to be slightly weakening uh, and slightly overextending on the king side, but he has a clear plan in mind. This bishop on b7 is a bad piece for as long as the pawn is on e4. What do you want to do? You want to remove the pawn. Once you remove this pawn, if you imagine this pawn not being here, then the bishop has a very clear target on the g2 square, which is a key defensive square around the white king. So f5 is a very logical continuation. Now let's look at how Gary uh, exploited his bishop pair. Rook a to e1 was played, knight to c6, ef5, G takes f5, uh, trying to open up the g file as well. And of course, Gary Kasparov was a wonderful attacking player, so he knows what to do. If you take with the e pawn, uh, then you are leaving uh, yourself weak to the attacks from the from the g5 square, and uh, you want to counterattack at, at the same time. You have weaknesses on the king side because of f5, so the only way to dampen them is to create counterattacking chances of your own. Rook to e2, rook a to e8, rook f to e1. King to h8, queen to h3, knight to d4. Now already, this bishop is a monster. You can see that once the knight from f3 is removed, uh, the bishop uh, on b7 is going to be even stronger. Now white doesn't have any other option but to exchange. Knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, check, king to h1. Uh, let's compare the minor pieces. Uh, it all started with... Uh, White giving up his bishop pair, and then black playing the risky move f5. And ever since the move f5, this bishop gained a lot more scope. Uh, Gary Kasparov also found the amazing exchange on d4. And now, uh, if you compare this bishop to this bishop, and this knight to this bishop, then I don't think there's any argument in this position. Uh, in conjunction with the open g file, this bishop pair is so far, so powerful that the game is actually lost, and Tiviakov should have resigned. He did last 20 more moves because he is a grandmaster, 
but this position is almost unbearable and black's advantage is overwhelming the only difference in the positions is that black has the bishop pair um, the material as you can see is equal both sides have two rooks you could even argue that white's rooks are much better uh, the queens are white's queen is more active black's king is less safe uh, were there not for the for the bishop pair and uh, because the bishop pair is here, all of the factors I mentioned become irrelevant, and black is simply winning. Uh, the second example I wanted to show you is uh, an amazing game, and this is probably one of the most famous games featuring the bishop pair in history. This is uh, Geller Keres from 1952. Uh, and in this position, uh, Paul Keres of Estonia, uh, Soviet Union back then, played f6 trying to remove the knight from e uh, from e5 and uh, fm geller continued with bishop to d3 uh, of course double attacking the the black knight so trying to exchange some pieces uh, we have knight to d6 bishop takes h7 winning a pawn and now f takes e5 rook takes d6 now the material uh, if you count the material white has six pawns black has five pawns and uh, white has the bishop pair. Bishop to d5 was played, and uh, Efim Geller allowed, allowed this move. Uh, he could have played something else. He played rook to d5, knowing that bishop here would happen, and in his mind he had an idea of an exchange sacrifice. So now it's obvious that the rook is lost, lost unless Efim Geller sacrifices. So now rook takes d5, e takes d5, rook takes d5. And now we have a situation in which black has the two rooks, white has the two bishops, but white is completely winning. Of course white is a couple of pawns up, but the position is open, Black's knight is ridiculous, and this bishop pair is too strong. Now let's see what happened. Rook to c1, pinning the bishop, king to f1, uh, defending the bishop and preparing to play king to f2 to unpin. Knight c6, getting the knight out of the way and defending the e5 pawn. King to e2, rook to d8, challenging the rook. And uh, now you might think that since you are, uh, well, the material is equal, but the rooks are going to be stronger in an endgame, you are wrong. Uh, Fm Geller simply exchanged, he doesn't want to retreat to a silly square such as b5. Rook d8, knight d8, bishop to c3. And now let's compare the pieces. Black has a rook, which, is, which has invaded the first rank, which is actually a downside because it can't really get out easily. Uh, it's really hard to activate the rook once again, and black has the knight. White, on the other hand, is controlling the entire board, and these two bishops are so powerful that even if you gave black uh, a rook instead of the knight, white would still have a fighting chance and perhaps even still be better. The game continued king e6, bishop g8 check, king to d6, f4, trying to open up the position even further. When you have the bishop pair, you want to open up the position. EF4, EF4, knight e6, defending the pawn, and now simply bishop to e5 check, king to d5, bishop takes g7, because now uh, the knight is pinned to the king, rook c8. And here, uh, Fm Geller decided that he has too many pawns not to be winning without the bishop pair even, so bishop e6, king e6, king f3, and this po these pawns went on to win the game. So if Geller sacrificed the exchange in order to have a very ac active bishop pair in the, in the center, and he knew that his bishop pair is going to be better than black's rooks. Uh, the last example I wanted to show you uh, is a very crushing game in which uh, Vladimir Kramnik taught Gata Kamsky a very rough lesson. It was played in 1996. Uh, in this position, Gata Kamsky made, made a strange dis decision. Uh, he gave up his bishop pair to mess up Kramnik's pawns and to create a target on f6. He played bishop takes f6, g takes f6, and uh, he played knight to e4, attacking the f6 pawn. And believe it or not, Vladimir Kramnik allowed that. He saved his bishop, moving it to c6, and allowed this pawn to, po to fall with check. So now knight takes, knight takes f6 check, king to e7, knight to h5, misplacing the knight. White is a pawn up. White has six pawns. Black has five pawns, but black has the very powerful bishop pair. Once again, compare the minor pieces. This uh, this bishop on c6 is the best piece on the board. That's definitely true. This bishop is slightly passive, reduced in scope. He only has two possibilities, either e, e2 or d3. 
This knight uh, is a bad knight. If it tries to get back into the game, it's going to take up the squares that the bishop should have. And the position is really rough for, for white, even though he is a pawn up. Let's see how the game continued. Rook to g8 uh, by Kramnik, activating his, his rook. Now almost all of his pieces are active. f3, uh, rook to g5, chasing the knight away. Knight to f4, h5, extending on the queen side, h4. Bishop h... oh, sorry. h5, h4, rook to e5, knight to d3, and intermezzo, bishop h6, check, and now look at the bishops. Look at these two bishops. In this game, you can see the power of the bishop pair so vividly. Uh, I mean, after analyzing this game, it's really hard to give up a bishop and give your opponent the bishop pair. Uh, they're so dominating this board than that uh, Gatakamski is actually lost already. Check out all the pieces. The rooks are more active, the bishops are more active, and white actually has nothing to do. White can't play this position anymore. He played king b1. We have rook to e3, improving the rook even more. Rook e1 challenging the rook, but now rook to g8, allowing the trade, because now after rook e3, bishop e3, how do you develop? How do you do anything with, this two, with these two bishops in your position? c3, f5. King c2, king f6, marching the king up the board, having another piece up, because the king is much better than, than the king on c2. Rook h3, trying to get into the game, but now f4, and the rook is trapped, the rook has no squares, the rook can't get into the game. Those two bishops are dominating three minor pieces white has. King d1, e5, taking up even more squares. Where can the knight go? The knight has this square, this square, this one, this one, this one. This one, this one, and this one. The only good square is here, on b4. And once the bishop gets to b7, then what do you do? <laughs> you have no more square, squares once again. The bishop is dead on f1, and the rook is dead on, on h3. This game is just a masterpiece of, of peace play, and uh, a great proof of how bi the bishop pair dominates the entire board. King to e2 was played, getting the king into the game. Bishop d7, attacking the rook. Rook h1, bishop f5. Look at them. Look at these two bishops. This is just wonderful. King d1, rook d8. Getting the last piece into play, and this is now resignable. This is just... This is just over. Uh, you are playing three pieces down. This is unbearable. If I turned on the engine, the engine says is it's minus two. It's minus two. White is a pawn up, and uh, the bishop pair compensates for the one pawn and actually gives... Uh, black a two-point advantage. This position is just lost. Okay, uh, these were the three games I wanted to show you. I would advise you to, to analyze them yourself to see how uh, the winning side uh, got their bishop, Per Efim, Geller, Kasparov and Kramnik, how it occurred to if you, if you play the openings that you don't commit to the same mistake yourself. Uh, I hope you liked the video. I hope I managed to emphasize the power of the bishop pair enough and uh, please do let me know what you think. Uh, thanks very much for watching and st stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.